basic overview here is we're going to do a definition in the f about the function of emotion. Though we all have emotions on an everyday basis, very rarely do we stop to consider exactly what they are, maybe how different they are from our moods, how different they are from uh, just being hungry, from just being tired. So we're going to look a lot about the explicit definition and the function of emotion. We're going to do the me search of emotion. I think there's another presenter who uses a, a me acronym. I, I love this idea because, of course, we all have emotions. We can all be me searchers of emotion, and I want us to kind of check in and touch base about whether or not these ideas that I'm presenting and the ideas of other researchers really has resonance and relevance to our own life. That's what makes it important and useful. We're going to talk about emotions and stress. Has anybody in this room ever felt stress? Please raise your hand. <laughs> All right. OK. So we have some people who may benefit from this. We're going to then transition a little bit into how emotions and communication are related, kind of essentially looking at what is it within emotion, both what we express in our face, how we feel, how does that really translate and facilitate our communication. We're going to look at the way that emotion can help us feel motivation to really connect to what's important to us and emotions and mindfulness. What are the ways in which emotion and mindfulness have meaningful overlaps? So we'll start here uh, with this me search. And this is just a moment for us to kind of sit and reflect on what was the most recent emotion that you felt? So before, you know, before I give you my definition and all this research, can you just take a moment, either write or think about what was the most em recent emotion that you felt? Do you know where it came from? Did you, did you want to feel this emotion? How long did it last? So consider for a moment just that emotional experience. I may ask someone to volunteer one later. So if you have a good one, please be thinking about it. Uh, I just want to give you another uh, additional kind of information on who I am, where I'm coming from, and resources that might be useful or available to you. I uh, started this work um, with this kind of very creepy photo of me as a crisis counselor. Um, I was working at San Francisco General Hospital in the emergency room. It's the level one trauma center. I'm not sure which is the equivalent here in Sydney, but working in a trauma center is um, traumatizing and terrible and for sure the best job I ever had. Uh, very rewarding, very meaningful. You had the opportunity to work with patients when they really needed you, when they really were in a state of crisis. It inspired my research, it made me think, what is it that we need to do as care providers, be them social workers like myself, medical doctors, psychologists, nurses, radio, uh, radiology techs, how do we allow these people to be able to show up at their job every day not feel burnt out, be able to emotionally engage, and be able to go home and feel good about what they did. Uh, I am part of the uh, Paul Ekman Group trainer. So my dad is running an organization in which they do both online trainings as well as live trainings. Some of them have to do with what I'll tell you about today. Some of them have a broad range, including deception. How do you recognize if someone is lying to you? Sorry, I will not be covering that topic, um, but I will be able to tell later on if you ask me any questions, everything that you're thinking. <laughs> so be very, very aware. Uh, I am affiliated with the Greater Good Institute. Um, if you do not know this resource, I highly recommend checking them out online. If you're here today, it essentially means you want to know a little bit more about the research and ideas surrounding a meaningful life. This center is dedicated to translating research that comes out every single week, then making it available to people who want to use it and integrate it into their everyday life. Everything from parenting to empathy to um, other kind of skills to be a good, a good human being. So Greater Good Center is wonderful. I've done some trainings for them as well. Santa Barbara Institute for Consciousness Study, that is where uh, B. Allen Wallace is located and they do a series of uh, retreats. I am an employee officially of them because of a teacher training that I teach, which I'll get into a little bit later. Mindful Schools is in California and Atentamente is in Mexico. Both of these organizations do online training for school teachers to be mindful. And in order for them to th be able to transmit those ideas to the children that they work with, as well as show up meaningfully every day. I've been a consultant for both on research as well as content in terms of the emotional skills that they give to teachers. If you are looking for more information, if you yourself are a teacher or educator in the room, I highly recommend, especially Mindful Schools, unless you're fluent in Spanish, 
Um, Mindful Schools has a completely online training, so you don't have to go all the way to California to attend. They have a lot of free resources, and um, that's available for folks as well. So just to give you a little background on this Cultivating Emotional Balance training, I've been teaching it the last four years. The Cultivating Emotional Balance training was at a center in Phuket, Thailand, called Tanyapura, and then this last year at Casa Tibet, which was in Mexico. Next summer, it will be in Scotland. So we are trying to diversify locations to get as many teachers as we can possible. You're very lucky in Australia. You have more teachers here than anywhere else in the world. In total, there are 200 teachers, meaning 200 people have been certified in this training. Now, this training is a combination of both contemplative science and Western psychology. Um, as I was suggested, there was a meeting in the year 2000 between His Holiness the Dalai Lama and a variety of people on destructive emotions. A book came out of this meeting called Destructive Emotions by Danny Goleman that some of you may be familiar with. And His Holiness said, are we just going to be talking about this or are we going to make something happen? Is something real going to occur? And what happened was uh, my dad and Alan kind of volunteered themselves to create a training that was secular, that didn't require you to be a Buddhist, but that would give you the very best tools available to cultivate emotional balance. And they thought a long time about what they should title this training. Should it be a, a, a training for genuine happiness, a training for pure mental balance? But they really thought emotion was an important part of this, and I hope by the end of this um, lecture today you'll understand why. So this is, their, um, this is the article that came out in the year 2011. It was a randomized control trial. For the people who are not academics in the room, um, very lucky to be so. It means that it was an enormously rigorous trial. Um, just like a medication, you'd want to be sure that the dose and what was in it had a meaningful effect with each person. In the same way, when you do a training, you want to make sure that training in, has a dose and effect that's similar among people. Some of the greater uh, impacts of this training was that there was people felt better. They used a whole group of school teachers. Who better to target than school teachers who are affecting the youth every single day? And to give them some resources to deal with stress. So they had a kind of a less negative affect, meaning they felt a little less frustrated and angry every day. They were able to reduce depression, increase their mindfulness, and maybe most importantly, that it improved the way that they uh, a hostile behavior marital interaction task which is a short way of saying they were really nice when they went home. <laughs> which, you know, it's wonderful for us to think about how to cultivate emotional balance in the workplace. But part of that is because half of our life is at work and half of our life is at home. And there should be not, we shouldn't be saving, we shouldn't be saying, oh, my entire life is work or my entire life is home. Because we're wasting a lot of time in between. And the reality is what is going on at home and what is going on at work they really do interact and affect one another. So the goals of the uh, CEB training is a whole wide range of exercises. Yesterday in the workshop, we really we got down into some of the nitty gritty and I was really impressed with folks. They were able to really think about and apply the ideas of what is an emotion? What leads to an emotion? How does an emotion feel in the body? How do we feel about our emotion once it's passed? And what can we do to understand maybe patterns of emotions, the ways that emotions un unfold over time and influence our everyday life and relationships? There's the biggest thing here is choice, which is bolded. We don't want to erase emotions. That would be a very unpleasant way to live, um, not very successful. However, what we do want to do is allow people an opportunity to choose. Is this the way I want to feel right now? Does this actually fit with the person I intend to be? Is this m constructive? Um, is it leading towards something that is functional and useful in my everyday life? So the definition here of emotion, this is coming from a uh, psychological perspective, why emotions exist. And when I say psychological, this is including social psychology as well as psychophysiology. What we know about emotions is they don't occur for every experience. I, I don't feel that emotional about this tambourine. Um, however, if you know my best friend who um, I miss dearly was a tambourine player, 
I might feel emotional about it. So it's when something important in the environment occurs, could be just a signal like this, could be an event like a kangaroo coming down the stairs, and it even could be a memory that we have arising inside of ourselves. But what uh, our body does and what our entire system is set up is to respond to these important events. So emotions are designed to kind of coordinate our internal experience so that we respond well. And it does this so well that it happens before we're able to think about it. So when you think about some maybe regrettable emotional experience that you've had, something maybe you wish you could have put a lid on or not had drawn out so far, usually this wasn't something that you were intentionally trying to do. You weren't intentionally like, I'm gonna go in and really tell someone off. That's gonna be great. It just it kind of comes over you. You respond to the environment. Uh, I love using the example of traffic any, in any city. People feel pretty emotional about their traffic. Um, and halfway through yelling your head off out the window at someone who cut you off, you're realizing how futile that is. Is it really getting you any nearer to your destination or choice? No, but it's a response. It's a very strong response and one that we have a very hard time overcoming and creating, as I was suggesting, choice around. So we're gonna look a little bit at the displays of emotion. Um, where does emotion occur? Emotion occurs in the face. It's also what we feel in the body. We're gonna do a little example of that. Um, and it's coming from external and internal stimulus. So I just suggested here external being, you know, the unlikely event that a kangaroo would come bounding down those stairs. Or the internal stimulus that as I'm speaking here, I actually lose track and go back and think about swimming at the beach, and I'm like, oh, that's so great, swimming at the beach. So you can trigger an emotion inside of yourself through an internal or external stimulus. Now, there's uh, communication with others, this huge part of emotion. Any of us who've traveled to a country where we don't speak the language, you realize facial expressions are crucial. You want to kind of show people that you're happy, that you need something, you're hungry. You know, we're, we're trying to show a whole variety of things with our face in order to communicate what's needed. So this example I always like to use here of how different the communication is on faces, how different this could be. What I often like to say to people is, um, imagine this is your closest group of friends and you tell them that you just got engaged. <laughs> so <laughs> at worst, at best, right? But they don't need to say anything. They're not, you know, they don't need to say congratulations. Um, you would read a lot simply from that response. And often, you know, we forget to look at the face. We're so caught up in thinking or emailing or texting or whatever else we're doing as we're crossing traffic that <laughs> we may not even be seeing a lot of these signals. There's a lot of information we're able to pick up when we tune in. So the next part here, is um, a little video that I think helps illustrate the way that we can experience emotion in the body. Those of you yesterday who saw it, let's see if, uh, if it changes at all for you. <laughs> so did anybody who saw it yesterday, were they able to prepare themselves for it? No, it's still, it's, it's somewhere in between um, what people call our startle response and just pure surprise. You know, at first we're kind of enjoying it, then maybe we might even start to feel a little compassion for that poor frog, like, oh God, it's never gonna get the fly. But uh, in the end, what we feel is, <gasps> this incredible surprise, and you can still feel it in your body. And surprise is a distinct sensation. There are distinct sensations we have for fear, for anger, for disgust. Not every emotion has a distinct physiological signal, but there are those that we can actually tune into when we kind of practice what we call in science, iteroception, or being aware of our body's processes as they arise. Now this is, uh, I think, the only data slide I will show, and it's not even my data, so I'm just using this uh, illustratively. It's a wonderful um, study by uh, a emotion researcher who looks at suppression of emotion. So you think about you're feeling an emotion maybe towards your boss or your spouse or your friend and you're trying really hard not to show it, right? So you're not showing that emotion, you're suppressing that emotion 
maybe unfortunately you have a job or you have to do that all day long. So what this slide shows us is um, uh, we were, I was joking over lunch especially how social psychologists are trained um, in torturing people. Um, we like to do the worst things possible to them and then evaluate their responses. So this is an example of that. People were watching a dissection, an amputation of a finger, uh, and some of them were told in the dotted line to suppress their emotions. This is their physiological response that we're looking at here. So we're seeing that when the video begins, uh, they're told what to do, the film, and then what happens. So we're seeing how much that emotion actually exists inside of them, how, ch how, much, how many changes there are in their skin conductance, their heart rate and their blood pressure, and when they're told to just watch or simply appraise, saying, okay, I'm watching this film, it's distressing. The only thing I mean to point out when I show this slide is that suppression can actually make us feel the emotion more intensely. It's not a useful strategy over time. And when we're gonna be looking a little deeper at the relationship between stress and emotion, I want you to keep this in mind, that though we have these emotions, they serve an important function, they don't always fit appropriately into our everyday job, into our everyday relationships, but they do have a response, and the response is something we need to be aware of and be kind of trying to, this uh, reappraise you know, does okay. I'm surprised it doesn't do better. Um, you, you, it's hard to know until you replicate research like this what the exact instructions were, but we can prepare ourselves for highly intensely emotional situations instead of just go into it with an idea of suppression, suppression, suppression. Who here, by a raise of hand, works every day either serving people or working directly with other people? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, great. So I think, I hope this next section here will be relevant to you. This is just um, a way kind of to remind us how pulled we can become by the emotions of others. We see this image and immediately we see the fear and sadness of a young girl. We have some context, of course, it's not just emotion, but we should feel distressed. We should feel that we need to do something. Emotions are designed that we express and that we can receive help, counsel, and care. They have really important fu functions in the display. There are great individual differences of emotion. So these little volcanoes are illustrative of two different styles of emotional response. The person here says onset, meaning when they become emotional, it takes them a little while, and then they become emotional for a short amount of time, and then this is how they come down from the emotion. However, this person becomes emotional incredibly quickly. So you can think of, let's say, anger as an example. They are all the way through the roof for a short time, and then it's over. So many of us may experience this in our personal relationships with friends or partners, coworkers, bosses. And what we see is that some people have very different reactions, and our emotional profiles differ from one another. This is extremely important to remember. Not everybody feels and reacts the way that we feel and react. Aha. Uh -huh. So now we're going to look a little bit more about the distinction between emotion, mood, trait, and disorder. Again, just to give us a little more idea of what are emotions? Why are they important? What role do they serve? What aren't they, essentially? Um, we'll go through sadness here. So we have the emotion of sadness. When we feel sad, you know, as a result of, let's say, um, seeing the image of that, that girl who we imagine was in a great distress, right? And our experience of sadness it comes, there's an obvious trigger, we have a physiological feeling, we have an expression of the emotion of sadness on our face. However, when we are in a sad mood, feeling blue, this means we're feeling sad for uh, all day long. It's not simply a physiological response of sadness that then kind of comes down and we rationalize and we say, gosh, that poor girl, I hope someone helped her. Okay, right, and we're moving on to the next state. When we have a mood, it's essentially like having either many emotions that are re-triggered, you keep thinking about that poor girl all day long. Or you have a mood of sadness that has to do with something like loss, like a grief, right? It's again, something that's longer than emotion, but not a trait. So now we're moving to trait. Trait as often could be synonymous with mm, characteristic or personality. There are people who are melancholic, who are very sad. Many of them are musicians and artists, right? And um, the melancholic or people who are often kind of had that disposition, 
we don't we don't exactly understand why. Was it their parenting? Was it their genetics? Was it the friends they hung out with? We're not sure. They're likely a dynamic interaction between all of them. It can, as we all know very well, become a disorder when it prevents us from living our everyday life. And unfortunately, when people are uh, majorly depressed and feeling sad every day, they can't even get out of bed, they can't ask for help, and, and many um, very serious issues that don't allow them to interact with the world in a meaningful way. Luckily, there's been a great deal of study and research on how to help people, but this slide is simply to help us move along in our distinction understanding of what emotions are and what emotions aren't, okay? So did anybody, when they wrote an emotion earlier, actually write a mood? Anyone in the audience? Yes, okay. Yeah, I think it's a very easy, very easy kind of a confusion to make, but a good distinction because sometimes in order to understand our moods a little better, we do know a lot more about the science of emotion than the science of mood. It's helpful for us to make that distinction. So the function and dysfunction of emotions. Um, um, what emotions really work for, as we saw, is reading the signals of others. What are people communicating to us? How do they feel about our new engagement, right? But more than that, you know, what is our rapport that we're building with a client, whether in our medical setting, whether we're a teacher with a student, we need to be able to read uh, the expressions in a more kind of, you know, um, in the environment of our evolutionary adaptedness, uh, meaning where we all came from, when we were living as cavemen in very primitive ways, it really helped us organize and focus our body and mind to immediate threats, you know? The dysfunction is when we confuse what we are relating to. We, we, I would consider this tambourine to be a threatening object, something that was maybe dangerous. Uh, I mistook it for um, you know, a firecracker or something that was gonna make a huge noise. Um, and we have this happen a lot. People are coming to try and tell us some important information, especially in the workplace, and we misread what they're trying to tell us. We overreact, we become emotional, when in fact the intention was simple constructive criticism, right? And then we also can have kind of the wrong response because we've been so long suppressing. We're kind of letting our emotions leak into the next arena. So we totally lose it at a friend of ours who's five minutes late for dinner because of the entire week at work we've been behind. And so we're having you know, this emotion of anger, but it's to the wrong target. And so really being able to understand that emotions have their function, but when not appropriately understood or examined, expressed in a meaningful way, they can become dysfunctional. There's an important distinction here as well. A lot of people will talk about positive and negative emotions. Now, I, I think that's a little simplistic and sometimes can help us, or sometimes can confuse us. We can be very angry about injustice. That's very constructive, it's very useful. We can be very happy because someone um, is not doing well, you know, because one of our so-called enemies is suffering. That's not very constructive, but it's a positive emotion. So to look instead at constructive, what emotions bring us together and what emotions kind of harm ourselves or others is a way that is a frame I think is quite useful when looking at emotions. So now we're gonna get into, in the last uh, minutes here, a real examination of stress and emotion and its relationship. What I have here is a very simple diagram, and if you remember nothing else, I would be very happy if you remembered this. If you were able to take this home to the workplace, use it, apply it, in some way find it meaningful. Um, essentially what I'm showing you here is that when there is a lot of emotions, so over time, many, many experiences of emotion anger, frustration, um, you know, your, your boss is giving you a lot of demands, your clients are giving you a lot of demands, you don't feel that you can, you know, your computer's breaking down, there's, there's all sorts going on. There's the intensity, some of those clients are really demanding, and there's a density, meaning you can't express them all the time. You can't tell your client they're being annoying, right? <laughs> you have to kind of mask and move on and push forward. This is what creates stress. So stress isn't some kind of, um, you know, periodic table element that we understand that's isolated in the world. Stress is the over arousal of emotion. If you want to learn how to deal with stress, you really have to learn how to understand your emotions. So, oops, sorry. Every time you're feeling stress, you're feeling an emotion, and the most sustainable way to manage stress is to build emotional awareness. 
this was a quote that uh, the last training I gave, someone wrote down and said to me, you must put this up there. This was the most important thing you said. So if you feel there was something else I said as important, please let me know. We can include more slides. Um, though time sadly runs out quickly. I'm just here a brief little bit on the mindfulness of emotion. This idea of emotional hijacking is what I want to talk about. How the emotions run away with us. Again, we are predisposed to have the emotions come quicker than our thoughts. If we had to think before we had our emotional responses, we might not have survived. So we are really working against nature when we're working against trying to understand and be aware of our emotions. It's really um, a difficult task to do. Simple, but not easy, okay? Um, we're not gonna get that deeply into empathy and emotional awareness or developing emotional awareness, but there's a lot more information online um, from myself if you're interested in those topics. Right now, I really wanna close by showing you a couple ideas about what burnout really means, what stress in the workplace really means. So again, um, we've talked about the definition that the over arousal of emotion is stress, right? So we have a lot of emotions, they become kind of overwhelming to us and that is what we call stress. So here, um, and I'm sorry for the S dropping, this is a Mac and PC issue, but this is, a, um, this is a model that was developed and then proved that when we have our resources that are available to us, let's say we're in the workplace and uh, we have a client or a student, we have a troubled student, I'm a school teacher, let's say, and I have a troubled student, they come ask me, they say, at home, my brother's beating me up, I don't know what to do, right? That's a pretty, that's a pretty serious trigger, but we have resources. We know who to call, we know the parents, we know what to do, we have training. So the demand, you know, we, we can manage it. We're in this challenge mode. Stress is working for us. Our emotions are functioning meaningfully. This is something important, I'm responding. However, when we don't feel we have the, the resources, this is when we can get into a mode that's more rigid. Like, oh my God, I don't know what to do. This sounds terrible. I've, I've never been trained on this. I don't know this family. Maybe I just started in the school. Maybe I have my own issues. I, I really can't engage. So this would be when we would feel this kind of fight, flight, or freeze. Now this, this other side is often underlooked at, um, especially in human service care environments. Ooh, I'm almost out of time. And, um, and this, but it can be really toxic to be bored, to have no stimulation and no resources at all. So this is what I'm saying happens in a normal challenge and threat. But this next slide is what happens mostly in the workplace, right? Chronic stress. So we have many, many, many instances in which we have not just that one student, we have our principal, we have other students, we have other deadlines, and these things lead to um, burnout, emotional exhaustion, lack of efficacy and meaning, and depersonalization. And what I'd like to end with here today is really focusing on this part here. We should be emotionally exhausted by our work. It matters. It's important to us, right? At the end of the day, we will feel this. However, when we don't feel we can do our job well, and we have no efficacy, we have no meaning in our work. And that is what makes us withdraw completely. So we'll, again, what I'd like to suggest here today is a tiny seed planted to explore deeper into your own emotions. As I said, you are so lucky here in Australia to have many trainers of cultivating emotional balance. There's also many resources online to learn more about identifying emotions in yourself and in others. So thank you very much. Wonderful to be here today.